Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. The subject that I would like us to explore together is the value of theosophy. And of course, I can only address the subject from my own perspective and limited experience, but hopefully what I can share can spark some interest on the immense value of theosophy in today's world. And for that, we need to first address the question of what is theosophy? This is a very common question among people who find the Theosophical Society for the first time, but it is also a question that continues to resonate in the minds and the hearts of those who have been associated with this movement for a long time. Interestingly, the word theosophy remains without an official definition, and for that, it will always be a matter of inquiry, of exploration. And there is nothing more theosophical than that. We can even say that that is the very first value of theosophy, that it allows for the freedom to be conceived and to be known by each individual in their own way, again and again. We have quite a few definitions uh, that various theosophists have offered for consideration throughout the years. But first, I would like us to briefly consider the root of the word theosophy, which comes from the Greek word theosophia, formed by the words theos and sophia. Theos has been translated as God or divine, and sophia as wisdom. Theosophists have translated theosophia as divine wisdom, as a wisdom that is possessed by the gods or divine beings. And that can also be possessed by humanity, being ourselves a fragment of the same divinity. So in this exploration that we are doing together, I invite you to consider, as if it were for the first time, without preconceptions, what is divine and what is wisdom? We can always start from the definitions that dictionaries provide. And when it comes to divine, the definition is of God, relating to God, or proceeding directly from God. This definition will vary greatly in meaning depending on what our conception of God is. But if we think of God as the source of all, then divine is what relates or proceeds from that source. And then the second definition gives us another very important aspect of the term, to discover by intuition or insight, or seeing intuitively. It makes a connection between what proceeds from the source and what can be discovered by intuition or insight. Now, wisdom differs from knowledge, and even the dictionary definition acknowledges that. It says that wisdom is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. And notice that experience is placed even before knowledge. So we can say it is a combination of knowledge, discernment, and gained experience. And this is human wisdom. From a broader perspective, theosophist and Sri Ram proposes that wisdom is truth in action. He also says beautifully that wisdom is a quality of one's heart rather than the mind. The heart in the sense of spiritual insight or spiritual intuition. So an attempt to define divine wisdom could be direct knowledge or spiritual insight of the source 
or what proceeds from the source. Now, before we continue into the various ways of seeing theosophy, I would like to introduce the question, how do we know something? Have you ever wondered how is it that you get to know? What are the means through which we know and can know? And there is this uh, very important concept in Indian philosophy that is called pramana in Sanskrit. And pramana means proof, a means of knowledge. And pramana are the means that can lead to knowledge. There are several of them, but the three central pramanas are pratyaksha, which is direct perception. Uh, it is also described as this which is before one's eyes. Traditionally, it is said that there are four ways of, of obtaining this direct perception, and they are the sense perception, what we can perceive with the senses, mental perception, subconsciousness, and supernormal or spiritual intuition. We perceive and gain knowledge through the physical senses, through the mind, through self-awareness, a part of us that is conscious and knows to be alive, and through spiritual means, intuition or inner sense perception. Because we don't only have physical senses, we also have inner senses. And the second pramana is anumana, which is knowledge by inference, knowledge that follows, that follows something else. A very concrete example of this can be if we see smoke, then we know that there is or there has been fire. Or if we hear an ambulance, uh, we can infer that someone needs assistance. Perhaps in terms of teaching, we can say that it can be a symbol or a metaphor or a veiled truth that supposes the existence or cause of something else. And then we have the third pramana, which is sabda, this testimony or word of past or present reliable teachers. In ancient times, this was only oral transmission, but then it became written word. So in a similar word, uh, way, I wanted to draw a parallel here and say that theosophy can be known through perception, through inference, or through verbal testimony. And we can also, we can say that it is that perception, inference, and testimony. So as perception, theosophy is a reality that can be experienced, in a state of being. The more refined our own means of knowledge, the more refined or accurate the knowledge that we gain. Theosophy can be a truth inferred from a spiritual teaching. Sometimes it's metaphoric, sometimes allegoric, symbolic, sometimes veiled. And it can be a verbal or written expression of a reality experience or an inferred truth, as it has been the case of all spiritual teachings, whether they were in written or oral form. So to go um, even a little further, we can say that theosophy is a state of being, a reality that can be experienced. And this has been the case of all enlightened beings, but also of those who have in some way touched an aspect of this reality. It can also be seen as ancient or ageless wisdom, 
an expression of that prior perception in the spiritual teachings of all times, from which theosophy can be inferred, this divine wisdom can be found. And then we have modern theosophy, which is an expression of that direct perception in the teachings written by H. P. Blavatsky, the spiritual founder of the Theosophical Society, and many other theosophists after her. So another value of theosophy, as I will be mentioning them throughout the talk, is that even though these three fields complement each other and are the result of one another, theosophy has three different fields of exploration that can appeal to different inner temperaments. And with inner temperaments, I mean the shape that spiritual longing takes in each individual. We all have a, a predominant tendency. Eventually, um, these don't work in isolation. They, they will be integrated. But they may be our preliminary approach. So we may be more interested in exploring the aspect of theosophy that has to do with the state of being, this exper experiential part. Some people may be more inclined to seek it in the ancient wisdom traditions and others in, in modern theosophy. An integration of the three gives us all perspectives, um, the roundness of it. So let us uh, now explore more in depth uh, these three aspects of theosophy. The first one, theosophy as a state of being. We can say it is real knowledge or living truth. One of Blavatsky's teachers described um, real knowledge in this way, or theosophy as a state of being. Real knowledge is not a mental, but a spiritual state, implying full union between the knower and the known. So real knowledge is not a mental, but a spiritual state, implying full union between the knower and the known. So what does this mean? This may mean that our current limited perception of reality can unfold, can expand, or become subtle enough to be able to perceive directly the reality of things. That to know truth, we have to become it. Truth cannot come to us. We have to go to truth. So when this portion of consciousness in prison in all my conditioning can be set free, then there is full union of the experience of things as they are. This union between the knower and the known. There's this beautiful article written by Joy Mills, a beloved theosophist, that is called The Vitality of Living Truth. And in this article, she writes in depth about real knowledge. Let's take a look at what she says. Just even if we consider that truth as an absolute is beyond conception, we may yet discover that as a reality, truth is not beyond experience. It is essentially inherent in experience and in the experiencer when the distinction between the two has ceased to exist. So it mentions something very, very similar as, uh, from the, the previous quote. So this emphasizes again that real knowledge is not a mental state, but reinforces the point that it can be experienced and it is potentially inherent in every human being in its full extent when 
our sense of separateness has ceased to exist. She then says, there is a vast difference between knowing something intellectually and knowing it as a lived experience. And for the theosophist, I would suggest the gap between intellectual knowledge and living truth is fatal. For the former may leave us essentially unmoved in possession of concepts that, while perhaps beautiful in themselves, have never touched us. So she emphasizes the importance of going beyond the words, but also embodying all these teachings, making them a reality in our lives, test them with experience. Everything that we read in the philosophical writing has been the experience of someone. Someone has considered that to be things as they are. So how can I, where I am right now, have an experience of that or recognize that law or that pattern um, or that teaching in whatever form it takes in my day-to-day -day experience? So that is living truth, or real knowledge of living truth. And she says, the experience of truth causes us to be other than we are. It transforms us from within so that we can never be the same again. And sometimes we feel that this, in this path that we're in, things will move very slowly. But if we have been somewhat sincere, when we look back 10, 20 years ago, we can see that we have changed. You know, um, we have been transformed. And we cannot go back to, what, to who we were. So another value of theosophy is, it is this living truth. And when we commit to it, when we make the effort to make it a living truth in our lives, it transforms us from within so that we can never be the same again. And this is possible for all of us. Then we can address the second um, aspect of theosophy, which is theosophy as ancient wisdom. It's, uh, or ageless wisdom. It has been called the substratum, you know, the, the, the underlying layer or, or foundation and basis of all the world religions and philosophies. As the uh, H.P. Blavatsky says in the Kitchi Theosophy, she says, Theosophy is the shoreless ocean of universal truth, love, and wisdom reflecting its radiance on the earth. So theosophy has been with humanity since ancient times and throughout the world, prior to the foundation of the Theosophical Society, of course, because each one of the spiritual teachers from where religions and, and philosophies sprang had some level of direct experience um, with that divine wisdom. And theosophy has been called many names throughout time and its principles have been known and taught by the sages of past all over the world. I am sharing here, as, just as a form of reference, the many traditions in which these teachings can be found. We see them in especially the ancient East and West, um, in the Vedic and prehistoric India, in the, in the six schools of Indian philosophy, Jainism, early Buddhism, when, when the Buddha was still teaching Taoism in, in the ancient West, in the Egyptian mysteries, Zoroastrianism, the Greek mysteries, you can read Platonism in the Americas through the native teachings on the, of the indigenous people. Later on, the transmissions of these teachings in the East and the West with the different forms of Buddhism, 
Advaita Vedanta, um, Kabbalah, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, Christianity, Sufism, and Islam, Hermeticism, and, and so on. So every world religion is based on and comes from one and the same ancient truth known in the past as wisdom religion. You can find the teachings if you're interested in looking for some of these teachings. You can look for uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, Shankaracharya's writings, Nagarjuna, and you know, teachers of different uh, religious traditions, Plato, even Arabi uh, or, or Rumi in, in Sufism and so on. So another value of theosophy is the universality of its teachings and that the search for truth is the primary focus. So it's not the dogma or the belief but the search for truth. Now, the term theosophy was first used in English in, nine, in 1650 for the teachings of some ancient sage, sages and was later applied to the thought of the Alexandrian school of Neoplatonism. But the term was later used by the Christian mystic Jacob Beme and others who were called theosophers at the time, much before the Theosophical Society was founded. Now, one of the challenges that we encounter as we seek to learn theosophy, it has certainly been one of my challenges, is that in many cases, the, the pure and original teachings of religions became in time more or less corrupted by the intervention of, of humans. In some cases due to clear selfishness and ambition, but in others just by the natural passing on of teachings through generations, you know, losing with it um, some of, the, of its original meaning. So here is where we see the value of modern theosophy, the, theos the theosophical teachings brought by Madame Blavatsky in, through the Theosophical Society in, in 1875. So this movement that began at that time, her teachers um, write in their letters that they have been searching for a long time for someone who could put forward a movement like this to bridge the divides between religion, philosophy, and science, which as a consequence bridges the divisions among human beings. And we can see you know, all the suffering that these divisions have been causing throughout time. In the first pages of The Secret Doctrine, which was HPV's major contribution, she writes that the secret doctrine is the accumulated wisdom of the ages. And its cosmogony alone is the most stupendous and elaborate system. It is the uninterrupted record covering thousands of generations of seers whose respective experiences were made to test and to verify the traditions passed orally by one early race to another of the teachings of higher and exalted beings who watched over the childhood of humanity. After her, Many other theosophers contributed their perspective on the teachings until today. And these teachings are valuable for many reasons, some I have already stated, but a very important one is that it helps us recognize that golden thread 
of universal religion across traditions. So now I will, I will briefly share with you just a few of the many fundamental concepts that modern theosophy offers for consideration, together with a very brief practical application for each of them so that we can both see some of the, the, the major ideas, the most one of some of the most important points, and also how these concepts can become a reality in our lives and propel us to the actual experience of them. Of course, we won't be able to go in depth, neither in the concept nor in the application. But just to mention some of them. This is from the Theosophical Worldview. It says that the universe and all that exists within it are one interrelated and interdependent whole. Every existing being from atom to galaxy is rooted in the same universal, all-pervasive reality. This is something that science has been slowly catching on with. But this has been the teachings of many of these traditions that I mentioned before. In the words of Ramana Maharshi, he says, there are no others. And the suffering um, inflicted to one is this suffering inflicted to all. We, if we conceive this as, as a reality, and we, we remember as, as, as much as we can, this oneness in our lives, we will be revealed, we, we, will, we will see how it is revealed to us the many ways in which we may be causing harm to other living beings. We have this human tendency of making distinctions of, well, for example, with animals, just to give one example, many, we, we can eat these animals or, or cause them uh, a lot of suffering, but these other animals were going to keep at home and, and knit cute sweaters to them. So just observing those, those contradictions and seeing ourselves within this oneness that moves and, and is evolving and is in this one being. That is much more, a lot related with the, the last one of those practical applications that comes from Light on the Path. It says, kill out the sense of separate. So noticing as we interact with others as we walk in nature, this constant sense of being separated from the rest that really springs from the perception that we have from our physical senses. You know, as we see each other separated, as we see that we are physically different, you know, we, we assume that separateness. But as we see in, in some of the teachings that um, some of, for example, clairvoyant investigations, there are so many other layers of being and of life, as we will see in, in another uh, slide coming up, that reveal to us that there is no separation. And another uh, of the elements of this teaching that can be very useful and important in our lives is to remember that we are the universe and we share the same consciousness and the same power. We have so much more potential than the one that we're using, so much more potential than the one um, we think we know. Another one of the teachings is that the ultimate reality is the source of all consciousness, matter, and energy, which are its three mutually necessary aspects in the manifested universe. 
and are present in every being and every particle. There is no dead or unconscious matter. So in this teaching, this universe in which we move uh, and live is um, a periodical manifestation. So it's a temporary manifestation of this ultimate reality. This is this ultimate reality is the source of consciousness, matter, and energy. And every particle, everything you, in the universe has consciousness, matter, and energy. So there is no dead or unconscious matter. Everything is alive. Some of the, uh, the living beings that we see, you know, we can recognize easily that they are alive because there is, there is change in them. We can see there is some level of life there. But this is saying that everything that we see is alive. But of course, everything that we don't see is also alive. So every form has consciousness and their energy. And we tend to focus only on form very much on form. But um, I was recently reading uh, writings of Dora Coons, who was a theosophist who uh, had uh, some level of clairvoyance and she could see um, the inner side of nature and the, the subtler uh, parts of nature. And in those descriptions that she makes, you can see how there is so much more life behind the life that we see. And sometimes all it takes is for us to stand in front of something and become open and receptive to the life that is uh, enshrined in, in that being. So that's another way of, of perceiving this life in everything. But another even more important point is the recognition that if everything is alive, not only our physical body is alive, but also our mo our emotional and mental bodies. We are quite familiar with, with the intelligence and the life of this physical body. When um, you know, we give birth to a child, many times it is said, this is a miracle. And of course we know it's not a miracle. It's really, the complexity and the beauty and the intelligence of a body that is alive. And in the same way, our emotional and, and mental bodies, this is part of, of the theosophical teachings, is, um, knowing that we're not just the physical body, but that we are expressing, consciousness is expressing through um, these other cellular by, bodies and vehicles of expression. So in the same way, our emotional body is alive. So we are creating and we are co-creating who we are and, and how we relate with the world in emotional and mental levels. And that's why an emotional pattern has such power or a mental pattern has such power because it is alive. And the good news is that because it is alive, we can also change it. We can work with it. We can notice it. Another of the fundamental teachings is that the universe and everything in it are orderly. There is an order behind all things, even if we see them as chaotic. Following patterns of regular cycles including alternating phases of activity and rest, governed by a universal principle of cause and effect, or karma. In human life, this principle of cycles is expressed, among other ways, by repeated rebirths or reincarnations. But of course, there is so much we could talk about this. There are layers on layers uh, of teachings in this very short statement that, by the, by the way, these statements that I'm sharing here at the end um, are taken from the introduction to theosophy um, 
course that was designed by John Algio many years ago. It's a wonderful resource and it's available online on our website. So there's a few things we can mention here. This, uh, this sick, that, the, that nature is cyclical. It all happens in cycles. And, and once we begin to conceive this as cyclical, that things are cyclical, then we can begin to recognize the cycles within us. We are, um, as we will see, uh, we are a microcosm of this macrocosm. Nature repeats all, all the patterns and all the systems from, from atoms to galaxies. So we can draw, um, those, those, the teachings that apply to the macrocosmic level into the microcosmic level. So noticing this, the cycles we are in. That this path is not linear, but it is like a spiral. It continues to ascend or um, unfold. And in those cycles, we don't we we need periods of rest. We live in a culture that is pushing us to do more and more, and to never feel that we have done enough. And there is no, there is no way that we can find balance in 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 that way of living. So periods of rest, you know, the hibernation of nature, looking at at the cycles and learning from the cycles. There is this. Um, I was recently talking to a friend, and I was reminded of this, the scientific fact of how. Electrons um, orbit around a nucleus in, in the atom, and and they they go through these orbits. And there's there's several levels of orbits, and all it takes from the elect to uh, from the electron to jump from one orbit to another is to either to absorb energy or to release energy. And sometimes you know, we can see that our life is like this as well. In the sense that sometimes it is the lack of energy because we're so spread in so many ways that won't allow us to jump into the next orbit. So how important it is to gather that energy to then be able to jump to the next level in whatever way we want to address that. Another aspect of this is, is this cause and effect, that all cause has an effect. Everything we do at the physical level, all emotional uh, movement, all patterns of thought are things. They're alive. They're causes and they create effects. We create our own world and our circumstances. But we have been doing this, according to these teachings, for a long, long, long time. This is not our first lifetime. So we gather, we are gathering many times the effects of causes that we cannot even remember because we were not there. So working with what whatever has been created in the past with complete acceptance and also being mindful of what is it that I'm creating into the future. And another of the teachings from the cycles is the remembrance that everything Everything is changing. And that life is this constant death and rebirth. And seeing ourselves, you know, how um, much we, we like the rebirth, how little we like the death. Another important teaching is that we are threefold beings and reality theosophy says that we are sevenfold beings but then it can be condensed to these three we are a temporary single lifetime personality so the person that we are right now in this lifetime which is temporary it will die as it was born we have we are an abiding evolving individuality that reincarnates 
So something, a threat that transcends lifetimes and that connects all the lives and the experiences we've been gaining in each life. And then we are a spark or direct emanation of the ultimate reality. We are, we are essentially and ultimately one with everything, one with all. And John Hodges beautifully says, the integration of these three aspects is the driving force of our evolution. The moment we recognize that we are a divine being having a human experience. And that in this human experience, the what we call the spiritual path is the full realization or our of our divine nature. What springs from this is uh, in, in the first part it says that we are a temporary single lifetime personality is this fact that as you know, this this person that we are right now has an end, we cannot say that we are this body, that we are these emotions, that we are these thoughts, which con constructs the personality. We are embodying, we, we are gathering experiences experiences through the body, the emotions, and the thoughts, but we are neither of them, essentially. And the recognition of that is the very first step to becoming more open, to becoming more receptive to that abiding, evolving individuality that reincarnates and also eventually becoming receptive to the spark of the divine. In this teaching, we see that no effort is ever lost. What we attempt, you know, any, any effort that we make in this direction, in the direction of spiritual unfoldment, is never lost. And that is because of that uh, individuality that keeps the thread of all experiences. And whenever we feel that we're not doing enough or we're not good enough or we're moving too slow, always to remember that we're, we're planting the seeds for tomorrow. And all we can do is the best we can do today. Then it says, the key to the advancement of human evolution is a dedication by the individual to the service of others. That is altruism, an awareness of unity and a forgetfulness of personal separateness. So it is associated with the two teachings that we saw, the awareness of unity and the forgetfulness of personal separateness. So this altruism, this is mentioned throughout the philosophical teachings, the modern, modern theosophy. Theosophy is altruism. And why is it altruism? Because if there is the recognition of oneness, then what else would we do but work for others? So does we have these ideas of enlightenment as something that is like the freedom and the power of being of being something but really enlightenment means the recognition that humanity is suffering uh, the the recognition of of being something um, of being one with all so what the teachers did at that point was all of them was to help humanity so whatever fantasy we have about altruism, uh, about uh, enlightenment, I think altruism really brings us down to what really is being spiritual or what really is the spiritual path. To work for others and not for self. 
And this is not to forget oneself in the sense of not taking care of the body and the emotions and the mind, the needs uh, of living in this physical world. Not at all. We already spoke about the need for rest, the need of taking care, of pausing. But I think that working for others is more a matter of noticing our motivations. What is it that is happening underneath the surface? When I make a decision, am I always thinking of myself first? Or am I thinking of others? Or am I thinking of the whole? What is the greatest? Uh, what would be the best thing for the whole in this situation? And with that comes also, we will talk about this on Saturday and more in length, the renounce of the fruits of our actions. We're so attached to how, uh, to what we will gain from whatever step we make. That then the whole process becomes about the destination. It becomes the fruit uh, of what we're doing and never the journey. And the final one, it is very encouraging. It says, it is possible as a result of individual effort in this life for human beings to, be, to come by intuitive knowledge or mystical experience to a full awareness of their non-separateness from the ultimate reality. So it is possible as a result of individual effort to come either to the knowledge or to the experience of being this ultimate reality. Sometimes all it takes is to believe moment by moment that what we're seeking is right here. And we just have to wake up to it and realizing that we already have all that it takes for that to happen. And all it requires from us is that energy that I spoke about before, centering all our energy into this. Just to wrap up, mentioning again the value of theosophy. It allows for the freedom to be conceived by each individual in their own way. It has different fields of exploration that appeal to different inner temperaments. Its primary focus is the search for truth, not a belief. It assists us in recognizing the ageless wisdom across spiritual traditions. It bridges the divide between religion, philosophy, and science. And as a living truth, it transforms us from within, changing ourselves and changing the world, which is in the first place, the reason why we're doing this. And of course, many other values that you will discover along the way. So I hope this brief introduction may spark your own interest to explore both the simplicity and the depth of theosophy. Thank you for watching.